Accessibility, visibility, breaking down the barriers for people with disabilities in media. Please welcome Academy Governor and Oscar-winning actor, Whoopi Goldberg. Whoopi Goldberg is a black woman with shoulder length black dreadlocks, brown eyes, and is wearing purple round glasses and silver hoop earrings. She is wearing a very light lavender colored top with white buttons and a black necklace with blue and white beads. And she is sitting in a white chair against a textured background. Hey, I'm Whoopi Goldberg, and I am proud to be a governor of the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences, the Actors Branch. You know, 2020 marks the 30th anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act. It's a civil rights law prohibiting discrimination against individuals with disabilities in all life areas, including jobs, schools, transportation, and public and private places that are open to the general public. It guarantees equal opportunity for all individuals with disabilities, regardless of race, color, sex, national origin, age, and religion. One in five Americans have a disability, making them a part of America's largest minority group. But not all disabilities are immediately apparent. In this program, we will hear from an immensely talented and diverse group of industry professionals, actors and managers, directors, sound designers, VFX artists, animators, all who happen to have a disability. So thank you to all our panelists and a big thank you to the Ruderman Family Foundation for the grant which makes this program possible. I think you'll agree, yes, we can always do better, but we hope these discussions will help educate and highlight the importance and advantages of hiring people with disabilities, whether it be in front of the camera or behind the scenes. Please welcome our host, Oscar-winning actor Marley Matlin and interpreter Jack Jason. Marley Matlin is a white woman with below-the-shoulder length blonde hair and blue eyes. She is wearing a solid white top, gold hoop earrings, and a gold necklace. She is sitting in a multicolored chair in an office space in front of a large blue and white painting, some photographs, her Oscar statuette, and white and yellow roses. While a rarity in motion pictures, Authentic disability representation can be traced back to the silent era. Films including You'd Be Surprised in 1926, The Best Years of Our Lives in 1946, Children of a Lesser God, 1986, When I Walk in 2013, The Rider in 2017, The Silent Child in 2017, A Quiet Place in 2018, Give Me Liberty in 2019, and The Peanut Butter Falcon in 2019 featured lived disability experiences. Let's hear from actor Danny Woodburn and actor comedian Maysoon Zayed and talent manager Aaron Brown about authentic representation, why it matters and how far we have come. Authentic representation, why it matters and how far we have come with actor Danny Woodburn, actor and comedian Maysoon Zayed and talent manager, Aaron Brown. Hi everyone, I'm Danny Woodburn, uh, actor, comedian, and activist. I'm a white male man with dwarfism. Um, I am wearing a blue shirt, I had to look. I'm wearing a blue shirt, uh, blue suspenders. I have a full beard and the hairline of a cruise ship captain. <laughs> um, before we get started, uh, it's my pleasure to welcome Amanda Grazian, who will be our ASL interpreter for this discussion. I am a Caucasian female with shoulder length, brown hair, blue eyes, and a black suit jacket. Thank you for being here. Next, we have my friend, comedian, actor, writer, Maysoon Zayed. As a comedian, Maysoon has toured extensively at home and abroad. She had the most viewed TED Talk of 2014 and is the author of a best-selling memoir, Find Another Dream. She appeared alongside Adam Sandler in the movie, one of my favorites, You Don't Mess with the Zohan, and is a recurring character on General Hospital, who I believe has not been slapped in the face yet. <laughs> uh, thank you for that stellar introduction. I want to describe myself to the audience. I look like the lost Kardashian. I have cinnamon skin, 
long black hair, and I'm wearing a Prince Purple Rain Calvin Klein suit with a black and blue sparkly shirt. Next up, we have talent manager, Aaron Brown. Aaron is partner at Management 360 and has guided the careers of critically acclaimed artists such as Academy Award winner, Sebastian Lelio of A Fantastic Woman, Pablo Lorraine of Jackie, Bill Johnson of Wreck-It Ralph and Zootopia, and Kate Shortland of Black Widow. My name is Erin Brown. I am a 46-year-old white woman with light brown hair. I was born with an undiagnosed muscular myopathy. I'm wearing a blue and white pinstripe shirt with a ruffled collar and a bubblegum pink cardigan. Behind me over my right shoulder is wallpaper with blue and pink palm fronds. And over my left shoulder is a glass wall with more palms. I didn't get as descriptive with my clothing as you did. <laughs> but uh, anyway, welcome to you both. Um, uh, we have a very interesting panel. Uh, the panel, let's call it this, authentic representation, why it matters, and how far we have come. So the obvious first question is, why does it matter and how far <laughs> have we come? We hear the hashtag all the time, representation matters, but I want to talk about why it actually matters. People with disabilities are 20% at least, maybe 25% of the population, but we're only 2% of the images you see on TV. And 95% of those images are non-disabled performers. The message being sent out to disabled kids is you do not belong in this world. It is a very, very dangerous message. It adds to the stigma against visible disabilities and invisible disabilities, because we actually have no idea how many people with invisible disabilities grace our screens, because the stigma is so strong that even celebrities feel, you know, fear revealing that they're part of the disability community. So one of the reasons I think it matters is because people with disabilities face enormous amounts of bullying, of violence, and of discrimination. And I believe that positive images of disability in both fiction and nonfiction can help stop the violence that we as a community face. My personal feeling is that in the last five years, I have felt sort of an exponential shift compared to the previous 20. I don't know if you feel, do you guys feel the same way that there has I been? I feel like we're in so much trouble and that it's gotten so much worse. So that you are, as you said, the voice of doom, but I felt- I'm, I'm the goddess of darkness, but that's what, what I do darkness. see of disability on screen is mostly white men. So that's not really feeling very representative to me as a woman of color. Right or right. someone you know who works in the intersectionality of the community. I think that the images that we are seeing are still too infantilized, too much inspiration porn. And I know, I know that the stories are not being told by us. I still feel like anytime I enter a room, a studio or a set, I'm the only disabled person. It's daunting being the only disabled person. And I don't really feel like We've made progress until big stars finally say no to playing disabled on screen if they are not disabled in real life. Once we have people saying no to that, then I'll think we've moved forward. Erin, do you feel like as a, as a person that works with, you know, uh, with creatives, a person who essentially is, is connecting to um, decision makers, right? Writers, producers, do you feel like there's a shift or, or how do you feel about, you know, where we are, where we've come from? I guess I have to agree with Maysoon. I've never seen myself on television. And the, the great surprise for me was that I didn't realize that I had never seen myself on TV until a couple of years ago when a colleague took me to the premiere of his client's special, which is a wonderful um, series written and created and starring Ryan O'Connell. And it was the first time that I saw a disabled person just existing in their life and doing normal things like dating and having fights with their friends and squabbles with their parents. And I'm not young, I'm not a man, and I'm not gay, but that was the first time 
I felt like I had even seen a shred of something that I related to. Do you feel like you have any influence over the talent that you represent? Like just your, your mere presence or them connecting to you on a different level? Is a writer ever come to you and said, look, I'm writing this story, you know, what do you think of this? So they ask you opinion. If there's not other disabled writers in the room, would they ask your opinion uh, as maybe their only resource? No, they haven't. I do feel that I have a lot of influence and I take very seriously the responsibility, um, my contribution to the culture that I help create through the work of my clients. But the stigma of disability is so strong and so shameful that there has been a, a lack of discourse about it, even between me and my own clients, because as I do, you know, gently try to explore that and, and suggest when people are talking about LGBTQ or BIPOC characters, I'll say, what about someone in a wheelchair? But, you know, it's a fine line. I don't want anyone to think that I'm servicing a particular agenda or one of my own. Right. Well, you know, for me, uh, you know, growing up, I, I know you, you said you didn't really see yourself represented. And the times that I did see myself, I grew mm -hmm. up in the 70s predominantly. It's where I think the formative years occurred for me. And, and seeing somebody like Michael Dunn, who's a little person actor, or Billy Barty on screen, a lot of times it came with uh, pathos, you know, F filled in a lot of the, the blanks for the tropes around disability, you know, uh, the this, this sad, sad little man or the devious little man or something like mm -hmm. that. I don't know that there were very many positives. I pre appreciated their performances. I appreciated what they were able to do as actors, but a lot of times the, the storylines were the same. I connected more to somebody like Sidney Poitier, who for yeah. me was like a, a powerful influence on, you know, in, in my sense, what it meant to be accepted as a man. I think that really is like a big reality that still remains prevalent is that like disabled people only get three storylines, right? You can't love me because I'm disabled. Heal me or kill me. I grew up seeing a lot of disabled stories where families were better off when the disabled person died. Or I saw a lot of disabled people being healed. And I, I always talk about this one image that stuck with me forever was there was a blind character on Little House on the Prairie and he got caught in an explosion and he got his vision back. And like, I'm really glad I didn't blow myself up as a kid trying to heal myself. Like these things are really dangerous and we're just like inundated with these images that we either have to be, you know, charity cases where you get a blanket if you give us money or kill us and your life will be better. And I think we're still kind of living in those three stories, which is why I really do enjoy working with both Aaron and Danny, because I think we really are fighting for those mainstream images. Like Danny said, he was influenced by Sidney Poitier. I was influenced by Dolly Parton. And like the fact that she's not disabled never occurred to me. It was like, that was the kind of entertainer I wanted to be. And I pursued it and I managed to navigate that world by going through comedy because I did not see people who looked like me on television except in the world of comedy because comedy is kind of like the home of misfits. Right. My, in, in my comedy career was basically, I was told from early on, you just do short jokes. It was never about addressing sort of the way society has been looking at me and how it's been wrong, but how I should look at myself as wrong. So I, in my comedy, I sort of flipped that. That's the challenge that we have to, to dismantle is that the content that's been made suggests that we are the problem. And when you internalize that from a very young age, why would I bring it up to, to people, you know, whether it's my clients or otherwise, because I'm the problem in the world. The world isn't the problem, it's me. We've tried everything. We've tried shaming actors into not playing disabled if they're not disabled. We've tried showing our buying power. We've shown that we have the talent. We've shown that any project we do ends up being successful. It's not working. I've been doing it for 20 years and disabled people are still being shunned. We're not allowed to tell our stories and we're simply not included even close to the level that we need to be. So I wish I had some like 
positive story about never giving up and creating your own stuff. But I, I don't know. I think it has to be something where the unions demand equal representation and that if projects aren't inclusive and aren't accessible, then they don't get the status that they need to go forward. It has to be like legislated for it to actually happen. I don't think just trying to convince Hollywood to give us a chance has worked in the past 50 years. And it, it doesn't look like it's going to change unless it's forced to. We, we still have so much, so much, um, such an uphill battle because, you know, for the longest time, as, as you both know, I'm sure we have not been included in the diversity discussion. And then when we do make a little headway, uh, for example, what, what the Academy put out recently with regard to, you know, nomination requirements, there's tremendous pushback from supposed progressives who see this as, you know, a, a slight to the art. And they make these comments without a full understanding of the scope of what has gone on for, for years and years and years and what continues to go on unchanged and like, well, you know, art is supposed to be all inclusive, is it not? And they don't have that understanding of that part of the conversation. I think there's so many layers to it. I think a, a raised awareness in this moment of cultural reckoning is really imperative. And a pointing out include disability in the conversation when there are conversations about LGBTQ and BIPOC, that disability is a category that is automatically discussed, so it becomes normalized. And then I think that there will have to be something that's a, a big disruptor. I agree with Macy, and I don't know if it's, if it's legislation or certain companies decide that they want to support and they want to get behind a movement that says, not only this is the right thing to do, but it's good business and it good has- business really positive cultural ramifications and and you know it's opportunity for an intersectional movement because disability affects every group and anyone at any moment can become disabled so it's in everyone's best interest for the world to be accommodating Adam Sandler told me the best thing ever because I know it's really hard for disabled people to ask for accommodations. You finally make it through the door and the last thing you want to do is be a burden, delay any shooting. And I was having trouble getting in and out of my trailer. So I was basically jumping into a PA's arms and Adam Sandler saw me and he was like, what is happening? Make her trailer accessible. And I said to him, you know, I really didn't want to be high maintenance. And he said, look around. We were in Hollywood. I was on a set with Mariah Carey. I was not the person who was high maintenance. So we have to get rid of that fear of asking, but also understand that we will be met with resistance. So even though it's not our job, it's good when you're asking for accommodations to know what the solution is. To even better, that. it shouldn't be your responsibility to ask for accommodations it should be part of the contract and yeah. part of the line producer and a part of the production where they ask you what do you need to do your job right and it's not it's just not i think it also has to do with how forget the stigma around disability there's a stigma around actors right i think yeah. we need a disabled disney princess so we do have one disney disability icon nemo He's got the bum fin. And there's, you know, a belief that Lilo and Stitch is also a disabled story. I think it'd be really helpful to have a disabled um, princess. I want to end on a positive note because I was like so doom and gloom. A lot of disabled people are putting out a lot of fantastic work. It's amazing. Like, you know, Danny and I are producing this show and the number of new talent applications we got was astounding. And the amount of just pure talent in this community that exists that is ready for their close up is really inspiring. I'm seeing disabled people in every area excelling. We just need to make sure they get the chance. There's not a lack of talented disabled people in the world. It's just the, the lack of the ability to, to showcase it. And I think, too, uh, 
the people that we get that have the talent, I think the powers that be have to recognize they fought harder for their education than anybody else. And they did all that they could to learn their craft and be exceptional. And so I feel like that's, you know, we, we had to sort of go that extra mile that, that a non-disabled person doesn't have to go to get to that place of being accepted as a viable talent. That I think should be something on the minds of people in the, in the position of casting or producing a, a project that they go, oh, this, this person really has come a long way to get to this spot where I'm interested in what they're doing. And it's an unfortunate reality that we have to go that extra mile. But I think if they have a better understanding that we've gone that extra mile, then we'll, we'll be in a place where these panels are obsolete. I don't want our panels to be obsolete. This is the most fun I've had since the pandemic started. I think that one thing that would really change everything is if me and Danny co-hosted the next Oscars. That would be the disability representation that pushed everyone to have equal disabled representation on all their shows. I think I that's couldn't have key. said a better idea if <laughs> a year and a half to come up with it. Brilliant idea. I wonder who we could talk to. I wonder. <laughs> I think it's interesting to point out that I think there have been 62 uh, nominees for characters with disability over the Oscars history. There have been 27 winners of that category for best actress or supporting actor, actress, but only two had actual disability. So what better way to shift the paradigm than to have May Soon and I host the show? Um, I'll do your hair and makeup. Oh, cool. Awesome. You know how to do Lost Kardashian? I'll learn. And cruise ship captain? You know how to do that? And cruise ship captain. Yeah, all right. <laughs> Thank you both so much. I'm Thank glad you so you. much for having us. And thanks to the Academy. And now please welcome back Marley Matlin. Not only do inclusion writers call for diversity in front of the camera, but they also strive for equity and inclusivity behind the scenes. Employers might be hesitant to hire industry professionals with disabilities because of additional costs, but incorporating accessibility measures open up employers to a pool of qualified applicants often overlooked in the past. Filmmakers Jenny Gold, Jim Lebrecht, and visual effects supervisor Caitlin Yang have created successful and accessible businesses for below-the-line professionals with disabilities. Let's hear from them about their work, Behind the Camera, Why Inclusion Benefits Us All. Behind the Camera, Why Inclusion Benefits Us All, with filmmakers Jenny Gold and Jim Lebrecht and VFX supervisor Caitlin Yang. Hi, I'm Jenny Gold. I have blonde hair, in brown eyes. I'm wearing a red shirt with a pattern and I'm sitting in a power wheelchair in my home theater. You might know me best from the film I produced and directed, the award-winning star-studded Cinemability, The Art of Inclusion. And now let me introduce two good friends and remarkable people. First, the talented James Lebrecht, who has more than 35 years of experience as a film and theater sound designer and mixer. He's also a founder of Berkeley Sound Artist, an audio post-production company, and the co-director and co-producer with Nicole Newham of the Netflix documentary, Crip Camp. Hey, Jim, welcome. Hi, Jenny, great to be here. I am a older white guy with a gray goatee and kind of brownish long hair, and I've got a blue patterned shirt on. I am in my home office in Oakland. Uh, there's a red wall behind me with some posters on it, and that about sums me up. Now I have the pleasure of introducing visual effects supervisor, Caitlin Young, who is the founder of Alpha Studios. Caitlin has more than 50 credits to her name, including Robot Chicken, Grey's Anatomy, and Four Weddings and a Funeral. Thanks for joining us, Caitlin. Hey, Jenny. Hey, Jim. Thank you for having me. Um, I am a Asian American woman. Um, I am at my office uh, with white walls behind me with some posters of our most recent work. And as always, I'm surrounded by computers and monitors. 
Thanks for joining us, Caitlin, and welcome everyone as we take a look behind the camera to discuss why inclusion benefits us all. So let's discuss it. Well, I think that the more varied voices and experiences that come into a, a, a team working on a film, the greater the possibility for bringing out nuance and stories that really paint a, a, a brighter picture to what we're doing. I think for me, you know, right now in Hollywood, we are not only craving for ourselves to be seen, but we're really craving stories that we haven't heard before. And I think one great, you know, treasure trove of stories that we haven't heard before are from people who are underrepresented, especially people with disabilities. And I think it makes for great storytelling. Um, it also makes great business sense as well, right? Um, we kind of make up one fourth of America, which is kind of crazy if you think about it, everyone with a physical or invisible disability. And I think it's just, you know, good business sense, you know, for us to be included, not only in front of the camera, but also behind the camera so we can support one another uh, with the dollars that we're essentially voting whenever we're going to support a movie. How can we help other professionals make sure that when they're hiring, that they look for qualified candidates who might have disabilities? I think in terms of hiring, you know, as we all know, the world is really not made for people like us. If, if anything we're used to is we're used to, you know, adapting um, our environment for it to work for us. And that transitions into so many transferable skills you know, especially in the filmmaking community, a lot of times you have to think on your, you know, on your toes and come up with ideas and, you know, all, you know, all the good stuff that we are, you know, we've been essentially doing our, you know, our whole lives. And I think for people with disabilities, we do have to work way harder than others to get a seat at the table. I would say that the entry into our business, um, not only just having a disability, but it comes down to unpaid internships there are plenty of people who economically cannot do that and they are being filtered out. And then when we look at what qualifications we're looking for, for people or how people kind of get into our business, that we have to kind of steer away from this idea of the entry level position of somebody who is a production assistant that can carry 14 cups of coffee onto the set or that can work 20 hour days. And in the past, I think it's been traditional that we think that if you're not willing to put in the long, long hours and stuff, then you really are dedicated, um, to, you know, to working. And it's simply not true. Jim, I think, you know, you're hitting so many great points there. Um, I think one of them is we've been overlooked for so long for a lot of qualifications that we've been doing, you know, um, as we navigate not only our professional lives, but also, you know, personal lives as well. I like to joke and say that, you know, we, we kind of show up and we kind of do BYOC, bring our own shares, right? And I think especially for post-production, you're looking for talented people to sit in front of a computer all day problem solving, and that is our strength. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting. I've come to realize that my disability is an advantage for me. In my, in my career choice as a director, you have to direct someone to do what you want them to do which is part of the skill that I use on set with actors. I'm getting them to do what I want them to do my way. Uh, I grew up doing that. And I think that a lot of people do look at it as a negative, but it can be a positive. A phrase I hear a lot is, um, I'm a very precise communicator. And I say mm -hmm. all the information up front without you having to come back and ask for clarifications. And I do this because, you know, once again, I have been doing this my entire life. The ways that we're describing what we need to see and, you know, and the order that will be most helpful for it to happen, that's, again, it's one of our strengths. It's one of our expertise. And I think in a lot of times, precise communication it equals less communication and it saves more money. If you can get someone who has a vision and is very comfortable describing that particular vision to entire team, like I do as a visual effects supervisor, right? That's my job on a daily basis. Um, that will benefit the post-production team overall. So Zoom is a big deal now. Everyone's using it for meetings and they're becoming more um, comfortable with the idea. How do you think that is affecting your meetings and your future plans of continuing to work with it or not? 
So it's interesting that you bring it up. One of the silver linings I have found, you know, during COVID and taking a lot of meetings um, via video conferencing on Zoom or other platforms is I'm finding that video conferencing is kind of taking away the uncomfortableness that a lot of people might have if I were to take the same meeting and I would go into their boardroom and I would row in in my chair. Now I feel like Zoom is kind of putting us on an equal playing field or getting closer to at least where I can conferencing with someone and not having to worry about, oh, how do I address the elephant in the room, right? The odds might be already against you before you even share your ideas. But I think now on Zoom, we can just start with the ideas. We can just start with the deck, right? I don't necessarily have to feel and take a temperature poll of like, oh, how do people in the Zoom call feel right. about my wheelchair? Because when I show up like this, those questions kind of get erased temporarily, you know? I mean, I'll see, you know, kind of what, if, if their attitude translates to in person when we do meet, you know, but for now, you know, Zoom calls, I think has been a great tool of, you know, this equalizer in a way. Certainly starting out in my audio post-production career, it was always like that elephant in the room. I'm sitting in a wheelchair. And it was only by having years and years of experience and building a reputation that preceded me that I felt like I could really relax about that. When I first became a member of the Academy, I came down to Los Angeles and I wound up talking to um, the head of membership. And I was asking about disability and percentages and stuff. And she told me, you know, Jim, people are not willing to identify because of the stigma of disability. The fact of the matter is, in an ideal world, if everybody revealed or identified, people in our industry would realize that we're everywhere, really. You know, you can see me and Jenny and Caitlin, and yeah, you can tell that, you know, we have some body jazz going on. But there's so many different people who are right with you that have to hide their disabilities. I totally agree, Jim. Um, I think when Jenny and I first connected many years ago, we first became bonded because we have the same disability. We have um, spinal muscular atrophy. And I thought, wow, how cool is it that I'm seeing someone else that is representing me and finding the same you know, battle. Um, I will, you know, just challenge people and think about it. It's kind of like people wearing glasses, right? Having that one tiny bit just makes a world of difference. Our chairs make that world of difference for us. For some other people, it might be closed captioning, right? Maybe they are hard of hearing at certain times, right? And that's helpful. And having image descriptions, that's also helpful for other people. It's so common. And yet it's something that we're still not sharing widely because it carries this stigma, right? I, you know, I challenge you, do you know anyone who doesn't have anything? Yeah. Yeah. It's nice to see, you know, that people are starting to be more open and interested in the whole inclusion discussions. Um, do you think that the industry could do more than what it's doing currently? Absolutely. So I was bitten, you know, by the visual effects bug at a very young age. Most, you know, like most VFX people, I was bitten by Star Wars and I was absolutely blown away at all the visuals I was seeing. And I even remember, you know, from many decades ago when I was a nine-year-old, I was looking up visual effects, you know, in these books and I couldn't find any practitioners who were women. So one of the questions I carry with me for a long time was, well, I hope they're going to be okay having a woman working in this field because this is what I want to spend my life doing. And seeing the data now in 2020, I think that is still a legitimate question, right? Um, there are still no data, no official data coming out, but I did a quick data gathering on LinkedIn and the, the stats are not great. Um, the stats I found um, is basically 0.00. .00 one percent yeah. of visual effects supervisors that are a woman so yeah. we're still a couple of digits of becoming a whole number and if <laughs> anyone else wants to challenge me on those stats i welcome them too right because i would like to know other you know a uh, woman supervisors as well I, I think you even beat the female directors i think that's even worse <laughs> than the numbers yeah, that's even possible. i didn't think that was possible but i think you did it i started something called the gold test which is similar to the Bechtel test, that is the test about if, if there's two females in a movie and they talk 
to each other about something other than a man, and most films don't pass that t- simple test. So I thought I would start one called The Gold Test. Is there a character with a disability in this fictional story that um, is three-dimensional and not defined by their disability? To my surprise, uh, there wasn't anybody. There, there wasn't anybody in the film whatsoever in these fictitious worlds that we're seeing. So my thought is, if you don't exist in our worlds of fiction, how do you exist in real life? When you're going out for that job, how does that employer know to hire you if they haven't even seen you in works of fiction? If we, if we look at stereotypes that we hold, and we all hold stereotypes about people, and if we look at what the stereotype is of people with disabilities, it's not really good that you know that we're and but it is that it is really our industry's responsibility to not only hire people behind the scenes or in front of the camera but to produce media embracing that um we are members of society who are vibrant and and add so much and are incredibly capable you know, myself, Jenny, and, you know, Jim, we spend so much of our time talking about what makes us diverse. When if you think about it, what makes us diverse, we had no say in being born with these disabilities, right? An area that we did have a say in is the area that we studied and we practiced, but we're still not being brought to the table for the area that we spent many years studying. We're still being, you know, brought to the table saying, oh, hey, let's talk about what makes you diverse, right? And I think we need to have these conversations to get over this hurdle to eventually shift the focus on our work. But I think this is the start of that. And I think with the climate of all, all the other, you know, activism that's going on right now, we really need to harness this energy and use it for good and say, hey, it's not okay that we're not even 1%, you know, please help us achieve parity. What do you think that the studios need to do? The start of that is just asking questions right? Asking thoughtful questions. I had a producer once who hired me to visual effects on set and they said, hey, so this is going to be my first time working with someone in a wheelchair, right? This is a new realm for me and I'm open to learning. Can you tell me what I can do to help? Is there anything you need, right? How can I be a best support for you to do your job well on set? You, you, uh, it's been something I've been wanting to say and I really love what you said. You know, if I'm going to hire somebody if I'm not disabled instead of like being on the negative like well just tell me what you won't be able to do tell me how I can uh is there anything I can do to help you do the best work that you can I, I don't think I said that quite eloquently but you get the point and it's just it's a different attitude none of us get to your door with with being oversensitive and mad at everybody We've gotten to you with being able to deal with our disability and we are comfortable with our disability. So it's like, ask the question, let's get it. Let's just take it care of. And that, you know, I can be the biggest help that you're going to have. Let's talk about what advice you might give to young people coming into the business today. I think there's kind of a universal piece of advice for just about any question. And that is to find your community. And that is to find your tribe. There are people like myself and plenty of other people that have already been doing this work. There is a group that I helped found called Forward Doc. And it is a group of documentary filmmakers with disabilities. You know, we have over 100 members now. And I would say that if you, if you can't live without it, then you got to go and do it. You know, I always said to myself when I was, you know, little, wouldn't it be great if I can find a female Asian American woman who wants to go into visual effects so I can figure out how she's done it, you know? And I hope that others can take, you know, the lessons I've learned along the way to say that it is possible. That's the beauty of visual effects. Anything is possible. Um, If they can, you know, make the Millennial Falcon possible, making ramps to make other studios accessible is also possible. Don't give up. It's wonderful that kids today don't have to be the pioneers that maybe the three of us were. The groundwork is laid. Hopefully we've laid some more today. 
Uh, thank you all. This has been a wonderful opportunity to, to chat. So thank you guys for joining us. In an era of celebrating intersectionality, let's not exclude disability from the conversation. Persons with disabilities make up more than 20% of the world's population and come from all backgrounds, including various ethnicities, genders, races, and sexualities. What we see in motion pictures influences the way we interact with the world around us. In paving the way for a new generation of storytellers, let's create and promote stories from all these intersecting backgrounds by hiring talent with lived experiences to tell these stories. For our last panel, let's hear from animator, director, writer, Jorge Gutierrez, and actors Millicent Simmons and Zach Gutsagan, who will speak about Hollywood's untapped talent and unlimited potential. Fresh Voices, Hollywood's untapped talent and unlimited potential with animation director Jorge Gutierrez and actors Millicent Simmons and Zach Gottsagen. Hi everyone, I am Jorge Gutierrez. I am the creator with my wife, Sandra Guigua, of a cartoon called El Tigre. I'm also the director and the co-writer of a movie called The Book of Life. And currently I'm writing and directing a Netflix uh, movie series called My and the Three. It's my pleasure to welcome the very talented Millicent Simmons, the star of Wonderstruck and the blockbuster A Quiet Place and the forthcoming A Quiet Place Part 2, which looks so good. Hi, my name is Millicent Simmons and I'm an actress. Currently, I'm sitting in a room with a fireplace and a TV mounted on the wall. It's a bright, cheery room. I'm wearing a black long sleeve turtleneck and my hair is pulled back in a low bun. I'm wearing a ring. I'm a Caucasian 17-year-old female who is profoundly deaf. Thanks for joining us, Millie. And lastly, another extremely talented young performer, Zach Gutsagian, is an award-winning actor and the star of the 2019 indie hit, The Peanut Butter Falcon, which is amazing. My name is uh, Zachary Gutsagian, and I am the actor and um. You know, like I'm uh, fun and um, 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 just did to be with my friends and my family. Cool. Uh, thanks for joining us, Zach. Uh, I forgot to do my visual description. Uh, I am a 45 year old, uh, lovably chubby Mexican man with a, a black mustache and a hat that belonged to my grandfather. Let's kick things off with the title of this discussion, Hollywood's untapped talent and unlimited potential. What would you like to say to our beloved industry and all these producers and studio heads and directors about people like us that are uh, a little different, but we have so much more to offer. The title of this panel is so true. We do have talent and we are proving it time and time again and we have been throughout history. People with disabilities are continuing to shock the world and to change people's perspectives and open their minds to diversity. We are breaking through all of these boundaries and barriers. We are continuing to educate people that we're changing so much. There is no limit to what we can do now. That's, that's wonderful. Zach, do you want to chime in? I would say, um, I would say, um, um, good and, um, um, excitement and, and this show the uh, talent. I, absolutely. You know, I, I have a, I'm on the autism spectrum. You know, it's a thing that early in my life brought me some, some difficulties, but it's actually made me, uh, a lot more, uh, I would say it's become my superpower and it's really allowed me uh, to be really, really sort of focused in my job and really sort of uh, uh, inquisitive about the process. So that thing that as a kid I was told was going to be a weakness has turned out to be my strength. Uh, what do you look for when reading a script for a new project? Have you had to fight to play a role 
intended for a non-disabled person. When I'm reading through a script, what I'm looking for is I have to have that aha moment. That moment when I feel goosebumps or I feel shocked because there's a twist in the story or even a moment where I feel I resonate with a particular character. I need to have that. I need to have that connection with the character in order to immerse myself in their world. And it helps me develop my own character in my way. Now, I have had to compete against non-disabled people for particular roles. I have had to audition. And again, when I'm looking for a role, I try to find something that might suit me. I'm a young teenage girl. 17 and there might be a great role out there for me. I'm not above calling directors and producers suggesting they have a deaf actress for a particular role. I don't know why we can't make changes in scripts and in stories. It makes things more interesting. On a side note, in the movie A Quiet Place, John Krasinski intended for the character Reagan to be played by a deaf actress. And the producers didn't want to have a deaf actress. They thought a hearing actress would be acceptable. He fought for that because he wanted to have an authentic experience and to be able to have an actress who understood what it felt like to be deaf and how a deaf person would interact. And this is the reason why it's important to have people with disabilities playing characters who have disabilities because it makes it feel more real and authentic. Well, you know, I, I, I work in animation and the medium of animation lends itself to creating characters of all types, especially characters with disabilities. And I really believe uh, it's, a, it's our responsibility, uh, you know, especially someone like me, a director or a writer, to acknowledge people with disabilities and put them in the stories and in these films because that's the world we live in. And I also believe that uh, through the power of animation, you know, a lot of it is for children. So when you plant those seeds, and you uh, basically illuminate children to see disabled people as normal people. And, and you know, one of, the, one of the things that I find a little intriguing is a lot of times the disabled characters are perfect. But what I really like is when the disabled characters have flaws because that's humanity, right? The flaws are what reflects uh, a real depth of a person because Everyone who's disabled isn't instantly a saint. Uh, we're all, we all have our goods and our bads. So I think it's really, really important to showcase uh, that depth and that, that, that humanity. How do you feel your success in Hollywood has been received by the public and by the disabled community? I feel like when people started taking notice of me and my career, most people didn't know that I'm actually deaf in real life. And um, people are typically very surprised by that. And they say things like, oh my gosh, I had no idea that you're deaf. You act really well. And you're good enough to be in the movies. It's always shocking. And I'm never sure how I feel when I receive responses like that. In some sense, I'm excited that I've convinced them through my acting skills to believe my character. But in another sense, I feel a little bit disappointed and that I expect people should know better. A deaf character should be played by a deaf actor or deaf actress. But it doesn't happen that way. A lot of people don't know that. And it's really tough for me. As far as the disability community goes, I feel that the success I've had has helped them as well. They're setting their goals higher and achieving those goals. And from time to time, I have fans reach out to me and they thank me for instilling confidence in them. They say when they see themselves represented in Hollywood on the silver screen, it's just saying that we are smart enough, we are talented, we are good enough to do it. We can be successful. We can break through the barriers that have been set for us. And that's not just in Hollywood, but in so many other areas as well, whether it's technology or science or media. And it's so inspiring. I am going to say about, um, um, uh, those people does love me 
and they do love my movie. I got many of the awards. Awesome. Uh, well, you know, I'll, I'll tell you guys, uh, when I first was diagnosed with autism, I was 40 years old, so I didn't know uh, until much later because my son has autism and my parents said, well, he's just like you when you were a kid. Uh, and then as soon as I found out, uh, the people who represent me said, you shouldn't tell anybody. Uh, it's gonna, it's gonna, it might be something that uh, makes people think you're difficult, you know, all the, all the cliches and all the bad stereotypes. Uh, and so I decided, no, you know, I'm gonna, I think my work speaks for itself. I think what I do speaks for itself. I'm gonna be super open about my diagnosis. Uh, and I want to be a really good example for my son uh, when he grows up. Uh, and, and what that has turned into is uh, the autism community has embraced me. Uh, and I didn't even know uh, I was a part of such a loving uh, uh, community. I am now adding characters with autism uh, in, my, in my work. And I, I'm definitely, uh, you know, in animation, I, I joke that 50% of the people are on the autism spectrum, but they just, they've never been tested. Uh, but anyways, what stories would you like to see told in the future and by whom? I would love to see stories about deaf icons and other icons in the disability community. We already know who they are and where they are now, but we don't know what their backstory is. We don't know what their life was like and what challenges and obstacles they may have faced. I would love to see those icons who have so much knowledge and experience and the ability to tell a story and to let us connect with them and to do the disability community justice. I would really like to see that. I would also love to see stories from all over the world. I would love to hear about people's culture and their language and their traditions. It's an opportunity for us to all educate ourselves and to learn from other people. I am going to say the problematic um, um, uh, story in the course of um, comedy, um, drama, uh, super hero with the just just abilities. Superhero with disabilities. That that would be that would be incredible, Zach. Oh my God, I want to make that movie. What does the future of representation and inclusion in Hollywood hopefully look like to you? I, I'm gonna say about the um um inclusion. Inclusion. This is about everybody with just just abilities. They really want have a really good sense. I would love to see a lot more opportunity for people like us. I'd like to see more movies that focus on not only having a character with a disability viewed as sympathetic or less than, and more emphasis on characters with disabilities having more hope. And for the people watching these movies and shows to become educated and to learn and to actually listen. I would love to see more barriers broken down. And I wanna see more opportunities for people in the community to reach their dreams. I wanna see diversity. I wanna see varying languages and backgrounds and everything on screen. I want every person to feel like they're represented on the big screen. And for people to feel that they could even write their own stories and share them with the world. Great. Uh, you know, my, my dream in, in, in representation would be so that disability characters are normal uh, and, and they're in, you know, genre movies. They're, there's a Western and one of the characters is disabled and no one makes a big deal of it. It's just normal or a sci-fi movie with someone, uh, you know, one of the Fast and the Furious movies and someone's in a wheelchair and it's normal because that's the real world. So that's what I would love to see. What advice would you like to give young people with disabilities who want to break into our beloved film industry. 
My advice for anyone who wants to pursue acting as a career is to have confidence in yourself. Get yourself out of your comfort zone and truly believe that you can make it because no one's going to do that for you. You're the only one who can do that for yourself. I would encourage you to get involved in acting classes, whether it be in school or in the community. Maybe you could try Broadway and see how different that experience is with the facial expressions and the acting approaches. Read as many books as you can. Watch as many videos as you can get your hands on. Watch director's cuts. Watch different movies that are out there and see what it takes. You really have to do the work for yourself. You could write your own story even because writing your own story allows you to say what you want and to share your own vision in your own career. And you can decide what people might want to know about you. And that's what I think is truly important. Wow. The, the advice I, I love to give is no one's born a director. You become a director and you grow into these roles uh, through hard work. But it, it's, you know, if I, I always say if I can do it, anybody can do it. Uh, I'm going to say um, um, follow your heart, follow your dreams, and someday they will go big. That's beautiful. So with talent like you two, I think the future is looking so bright. I want to thank all our guests today. A huge thank you to the Rudderman Foundation, whose generous grant made this program possible. And finally, thank you, our audience, uh, for joining us today. If you enjoyed this program, please share it with all your friends and family. It's posted on the Academy's Facebook page and the Academy's YouTube channel as well as on oscars.org, where you can find some fantastic additional content under extras. So check it out and let's keep this conversation going. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. This program is made possible in part by the Ruderman Family Foundation, which promotes authentic representation in the entertainment industry and full inclusion of people with disabilities throughout all sectors of society. Additional support provided by the Los Angeles County Board of Supervisors through the Los Angeles County Department of Arts and Culture. Special thanks, Amanda Grazian, Caitlin Minocchio, Charles Mastro Pietro, Emily Simmons, Esther Tejano, Jack Jason, Madison Heim Genevision, Melissa Ziegler, Rachel Zavorsky, Renee Rittinger, Shelley Gottsagen, Stephanie Zuski, and Trish Carland.